in Texas watching the champ cars compete on the temporary street circuit. He joins us now from Denver. Jan, Juan Montoya's wreck really closed up the title chase. Was that just a case of miscommunication? Well, I guess so, John. If you're talking about the miscommunication between his brain and his foot. <laughs> but, uh, no, seriously. You know, Juan Montoya has made very few mistakes this year, and it was just a case of getting in there too hot. But to blame the radio or not being warned on the radio, you know, that might be a bit of a stretch, because you could clearly see there in the background that the yellow flags were being waved vigorously. We've talked before about cart drivers not having spotters on the road or street circuits. Would one have helped in that case? I think it would have, John, but like you and I have talked about so many times this year, that the cart teams do not generally use them on road courses, and a lot of times because the drivers don't want them. Many of the drivers feel that if you have a spotter telling you what's happening out there on the course, that it could be a distraction. Now, you may think, well, why didn't someone from the pits call Juan Montoya and tell him, because you could see it from the pits. You could not. Because the height of the wall, you had to wait to see it on a monitor, and there wasn't time. Dario Franchitti is now just 13 points behind Montoya in the chase for the title. Dario finished second on Sunday, but he was still unhappy with Christian Fittipaldi. Christian was holding me up, but that's fine, you know, if he's driving. But he was blocking. Every time I would go for a move, he would counter right at the last minute. That's blocking. We've been told not to do it. Cart did nothing about it again. And um, I took my chance. I saw a gap. I went for it. He tried to close it when I was down the inside. And, you know, if you're going to block, you got to. that's what's going to happen. Jan, what do you think? Are Dario's complaints justified? Well, I understand his frustration, but nothing that I saw. Now, we couldn't see every move that Christian Fittipaldi made, but he certainly seemed as though he was staying within the letter of the law. The cart rule book says you can make one move to protect your position. You just can't weave all over the place, and I think he did that. What about the move that Franchitti made on Christian? Uh, that seemed like a really high-risk move there. It was. It seems like the last three shows we've been talking about moves by Dario Franchitti. But look at this. He doesn't quite get all the way alongside and then makes contact with pieces flying off the car. And I'll have to tell you that he was extremely, extremely fortunate that he did not cut a tire because those winglets and those side pods on those cars, they're sharp. It was common knowledge that Christian was going to stop again for fuel before the race was over. If you're Dario, why not wait? Well, I think you have to go for it, John. I mean, he knew that Juan Montoya was out. He needed to capitalize. He wanted to get as many points as he could. If he was able to get by Christian Fittipaldi, he thought he might have had the opportunity to run down Paul Tracy. And, of course, he needs every point he can get. But now, like you say, it's pretty much wide open. He made several pit stops during the race. His teammate Paul Tracy made it on just one stop. How was he able to stretch the fuel mileage that far? Well, one of the tricks is, John, is that you want to use higher gears in places. And, you know, I had a feeling that they were going to go for a one-stop strategy because if you watch this here, they drop it off the jacks and they wait. They wait for every last drop of fuel to be sure that it's full. And that was my indication that they were going to try and go for it. And again, if you have a second gear corner, you would tend to use third. And the Honda power plant is very, has good drivability and low-end power, and that allows you to save fuel. Certainly turned out to be the winning strategy on Sunday for Paul. Thanks, Sean. We'll talk more a little bit later about the future of the kart series. Okay, Sean. Still to come on RPM tonight, Dale Jarrett may not have won on Sunday, but... His point lead did increase in the Winston Cup Series. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Paul Tracy about Sunday's big win. In NFL. Paul Tracy ran away from the field on Sunday and scored his second win of the season at the Houston Grand Prix. The win was the 15th of Tracy's career, tying him with Alex Zanardi for eighth on the all-time cart win list. Paul joins us now from Las Vegas, Nevada. Paul, congratulations. How great was that win? Well, I tell you what, it was a great feeling for... Not only myself, I hadn't realized it had been so long since I'd won on a road course. It was back in 95 in at, at Surfer's Paradise, ironically, which is our next race. But it was a great, great day for the whole team to get another 1-2 on a street course was, was fantastic. What did you think when you came around the corner and you saw that Juan Montoya had wrecked? Well, I'd been chasing him. You know, not, you know, I was trying to stay with him, uh, to pit with him under yellow or, or later on in the race when we were going to pit in our, in our window. And... And, uh, you know, he was driving pretty hard and starting to slide a little bit and, and lock the tires up. And then, you know, I got a radio that it was, you know, potentially going full course yellow, that Helio was in the tires at the last corner. So I kind of knew what was going on when I, you know, about two corners before that. And I saw, saw Juan clip the back of, of Helio's car. And I thought, well, well, I better drive smart from here out. I'm not the guy 
that's chasing anymore. I'm the guy that's leading. Now you talked about your uh, fuel window. Why did you guys decide to go with only a one pit stop strategy? Well, we talked about it before the race. Actually, we talked about it with Dario's crew, and we were just kind of, you know, shooting things around. And they said, well, when's the earliest you would pit? And they said, well, you know, lap 15 is probably the, the earliest that we'd pit. And when was the latest you could do it if you got the right fuel mileage was about 47. But I think the key for us why we didn't pit is because when it went full course yellow is when Juan had done the damage to himself with, with Helio. And that didn't allow me an opportunity to get in the pit. And it allowed everybody else to file in the pit because at that time I had a, a seven or eight second lead on third place. And a few guys got to file in. Some of them didn't because I stayed out. But really, the, I didn't get a chance to come in the pit because I was already mm -hmm. past the pit lane. Well, you said that you guys discussed the one-stop strategy before the race. So when you've kind of got that in the back of your mind, how difficult is it to save fuel when the guy in front of you, Montoya, was running as fast as he could and was pulling away in the early going? Well, I don't know if he was running as, you know, as fast as he could, but we were pulling away from the field pretty, pretty easily. And, you know, really, to, we weren't planning on doing the one-stop strategy because we felt it was going to be a stretch to do it. But once we were kind of forced into doing it be because it went yellow after I'd, I'd uh, passed the pit lane, you're almost forced, forced into it. And, you know, we, I was able to make the mileage, and obviously Honda makes great fuel mileage, and I was able to do that and, and get away with it. But I tell you, in the middle part of that second segment, it was, it was you know, Barry kept telling me, you got to do better, you got to do better. And, and, you know, I was able to, you know, pick it up a couple of tenths of a, of a lap and, in terms of fuel, fuel burning and, and uh, that's what got us to the end. Well, Paul, once again, congratulations and best of luck uh, to you and your team at Surfers Paradise in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Next on RPM Tonight, we're going to take a look at a couple of young drivers who tamed the Monster Mile at Dover on Sunday. This would be back to talk about the future of the kart series, and I may have misled you a little bit there. Jan, what I really want to find out, the short ovals next year, what are they doing to improve the competition there? Well, that's the future of the series, and that's because John and Houston, they decided that they are going to use a modified Hanford device on the short ovals. In fact, it's called the Hanford Mark II. Now, we know that the Hanford device on super speedways has provided some awesome racing. Well, now they want the same thing to have happen on the one-mile tracks. They have a high downforce version and a low downforce version. The whole idea, more drag, less downforce. If it works like it does on the big tracks, should be awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to see those races. There are also rumors out there that CART's going to become a one-tire company series. What's the latest on that? Well, I heard the same rumors after the race in Houston, and what I heard was that Goodyear had made a proposal to CART to be the exclusive tire manufacturer for the future. So I called Goodyear and spoke to Stu Grant. He said, no, we have made no such proposal. Then I spoke to Firestone. They have also not made a proposal, so I assumed it must be coming from CART spoke to CEO Andrew Craig, and he said, unfortunately, I can't comment about it. But what I can tell you, John, is why CART might want to do that. Because if you had a single tire series, it would be great for the fans, but maybe not so good for the manufacturers. The idea is that the tire manufacturers want to have the competition improve the breed, and that really tends to heighten the development and the research, which we hope would spill over to our road course tires. But here's the good news. If you had a single tire series, you then would have to do less testing because you'd bring less tires to each and every race, so therefore the teams don't have to test as much, and they could build a harder tire that wouldn't have a tendency to marble and throw rubber on the racetrack and ruin the racing. Time now to check out this week's email questions. Larry from Arizona with Technology Word is today. Why do so many drivers have radio communication troubles with their crews? Well, Larry, I think it is mostly when they go to a metropolitan area like Houston. Uh, because you broadcast at greater than one watt, you are required by the FCC to use business frequencies. So you go to Houston, you're competing with everything from taxi drivers to pizza delivery men. And also with the huge convention center that you had in Houston, as well as the fencing around the track, it's just tough to get those communications through. Brian from Ohio writes, I've heard some open wheel drivers refer to their spare cars as T cars. What does the T stand for? Brian, it originally meant test car, and that was from the very early days of racing when you would not necessarily use a different car each and every year. You would bring a car mid-season, call it a T-car, and test it out for the future competition. Well, CART has really never used the T designation. They use X for the main reason. We talk about radio communications. If you said 4T, they might think you're saying 14. 
Now, another interesting thing is in CART, you pay an entry for one car, but you can bring as many as you want. You could have a 4X, Y, and Z if you want and only pay one entry. All right, thank you, Jan. We'll talk to you again next week. Okay, John. When we come back, an excited Sam Schmidt.